Fishing was in my blood. Generations of navigating choppy waters, mending nets, and hauling catches. The sea was both my livelihood and my sanctuary, a realm of endless horizons and hidden depths. But that night, as we sailed under the cover of darkness, the ocean revealed a side I had never seen, nor ever wished to see again. We cast our nets like we had a thousand times before. As they sank, we adjusted our sonar, scanning for schools of fish. But something else caught my eye, an unidentified object hovering near the ocean floor. It was too symmetrical, too stationary to be a school of fish or debris. My gaze shifted between the sonar and the inky sea, curiosity edging into apprehension. A murmur of uncertainty rippled among the crew. Our eyes were locked on the depths below when it happened. A surge of luminescence emanated from the object, casting bright beams that sliced through the darkness like celestial spotlights. The ship trembled as if jarred by an invisible hand. Our sonar scrambled, then blinked out. We peered into the water, where the source of the light remained elusive, but its effects were undeniable. Around us, the ocean started to bubble, as if reaching a rolling boil. I touched the surface with my hand. It was unnaturally warm, like bath water. What came next was the most haunting of all. Fish, by the hundreds, floated to the surface, lifeless. Their scales shimmered in the unsettling light, their eyes vacant. The crew was paralyzed, transfixed by the spectacle, as if witnessing an arcane ritual for which we were never meant to be the audience. The boiling ceased and the waters grew still. The object, whatever it was, started to ascend, its lights dimming as it moved. With a final pulse, it shot upwards, piercing the water's surface and soaring into the sky at a speed that defied comprehension. We were left in a deafening silence, surrounded by the aftermath of unexplained phenomena and inexplicable deaths. I restarted the sonar. It flickered back to life, revealing an empty stretch of seafloor, as if the object had never existed. We decided, unanimously and without discussion, to cut our expedition short. We hauled in our nets, now carrying a grim cargo of dead fish, and set course for home. As we sailed back, the lighthouse guiding us through the dark felt different, as if its beam were now too shallow to reach the places we had glimpsed. That night remains etched in our minds, a haunting intersection between the known and the unknown. We return to fishing because it's what we do, but something has shifted. We cast our nets with a heightened awareness of what lies beneath, of the mysteries that dwell in the ocean's depths. Conversations on the ship have a new undertone, a recognition that the sea, our lifelong companion, harbors secrets beyond our grasp, realms that defy our maps and challenge our dominion. And in the rare moments when our sonar detects something unusual, when an unexplained warmth graces the waters, or a strange light flickers in the distance, we find ourselves glancing skyward, pondering the true expanse of our world and the mysteries that lurk beneath its surface. We gathered at the shrine, a motley congregation of pilgrims seeking miracles and skeptics drawn by the spectacle. Perched high in the mountains, the ancient sanctuary had long been considered a sacred vortex by believers and a curiosity by others. Scholars debated its origins. Ancient alien theorists claimed it was a cosmic portal, while archeologists argued for its terrestrial roots. As night settled, a communal energy enveloped us. Huddled in makeshift tents and wrapped in blankets, we chanted, prayed, or simply marveled at the sheer cliff faces that held us in their stony embrace. The sky, a sweeping dome of darkness, 
became a canvas of celestial patterns, stars tracing arcs that had fascinated humanity for millennia. But then, an anomaly, brighter and faster than any known comet, streaked across the sky. The flash was blinding, followed by a spectacle that defied comprehension. An intricate array of luminous glyphs materialized, suspended in the night sky like celestial calligraphy. They shimmered, radiant yet otherworldly, before arranging themselves into a configuration that mirrored the geometry of the shrine itself. The crowd fell silent, a collective awe binding us. I looked around, Faces I had barely noticed during the day were now illuminated in reverence or shock, each expression a unique response to the inexplicable. Phones were raised, cameras activated, but no device could capture the event. Each attempted photograph resulted in a blur, a smudge, as if the sky refused to be documented. The glyphs held their formation for a span of time that felt eternal yet ephemeral as if we were all suspended in a pocket of reality, separate from the natural world. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, the glyphs dissolved, their luminosity retreating into a pinpoint of light that shot upwards and disappeared into the cosmos. For the remainder of the night, the sanctuary was enveloped in a profound quietude, broken only by the murmur of whispered prayers or soft sobs. Some pilgrims claimed to feel a presence among us, a spectral energy that defied natural explanation. Others delved into ancient astronaut theories, fervently discussing how the event confirmed speculations of extraterrestrial involvement in human history. As for me, I lay in my tent, staring at the now empty sky, pondering the alignment between the celestial event and the geometry of the shrine. The symmetry was too perfect, the timing too coincidental for a purely natural occurrence. Yet it defied all scientific logic, hovering in the realm of the inexplicable, nestled between divine intervention and extraterrestrial communication. We left the sanctuary as dawn broke, each of us carrying the weight of an event that would forever oscillate between belief and skepticism, faith and inquiry. The path back to the mundane world felt both short and interminable, as if we were crossing not just geographical distance, but also dimensions of understanding. And while life resumed its familiar patterns, the experience remained, a spectral event imprinted on the collective consciousness of those who witnessed it. No proof, no tangible evidence, just the haunting resonance of a night when the sky spoke in glyphs and the earth listened in awe. The energy of Mardi Gras in New Orleans was intoxicating. The streets bustled with revelers, Jazz music filled the air, and the vivid colors of costumes and floats were a feast for the eyes. Amidst the celebrations, I found myself wandering down a less trodden path, drawn to the allure of a dimly lit curiosity shop. The shop was a treasure trove of artifacts, each with its own story, but my attention was captured by a mask hanging on the wall. It was beautiful yet haunting, a depiction of an old voodoo queen with intricate beadwork and feathers, its eyes vacant yet compelling. A shiver ran down my spine as I tried it on. The world around me blurred, and I was thrust into a vision of a different era. The streets of New Orleans were still familiar, but the buildings were older, the people dressed in 19th century attire. I stood in a crowded market square, where a woman, regal and commanding, led a ritual. Her voice, powerful and melodious, chanted incantations as the crowd swayed, lost in a trance. It was the voodoo queen, and I was witnessing her in her prime, a pillar of strength and mysticism in the community. The vision shifted. I saw snippets of her life, intimate ceremonies and hidden bayous, 
healing the sick with herbs and potions, and guiding the lost with her spiritual insights. As suddenly as it began, the vision ended. I was back in the curiosity shop, the weight of the mask pressing against my face. I carefully removed it, my hands trembling. The shopkeeper, an elderly woman with knowing eyes, approached. You've seen her, haven't you? She whispered. I nodded, still processing the experience. Who was she? That mask belonged to Marie, a revered voodoo queen from centuries ago, she explained. It's said that those who wear the mask are granted a glimpse into her world. With a mix of awe and trepidation, I decided to purchase the mask. It was more than just a relic. It was a portal to a bygone era, a testament to the enduring spirit of the voodoo queen and the rich tapestry of New Orleans history. As an ER nurse, I've seen my fair share of strange things during the graveyard shift, but nothing prepared me for the night that I saw the ghost of a young child wandering the halls of our pediatric ward. It started like any other night, busy and chaotic. We had a bad car accident come in, so all hands were on deck in the ER. Once things finally calmed down around 3 a.m., I decided to stretch my legs and grab a coffee upstairs. That's when I saw him. A young boy, no more than six or seven, peeking his head around the corner at the end of the long hall. He had this lost, forlorn look on his face that struck me as odd. Quietly, I called out, Hey there, are you lost? But he didn't respond. He only stared back with sad eyes before disappearing around the corner. I hurried after him, turning the corner only to find the hallway completely empty. A chill went down my spine. There's no way he could have gotten out of there that fast. I searched every room, every nook and cranny of that ward looking for the boy, but he was nowhere to be found. When I told the other nurses what I had seen, they just nodded. It turns out several of them had seen this ghostly boy over the years, always wandering the halls late at night. We now think he's the spirit of a child who passed away here long ago, still drawn to the pediatric ward where he spent his final days. Though the encounter spooked me at first, I now find it kind of comforting to think that he finds some solace in visiting the kids, like he's watching over them, even from beyond. So, if you ever find yourself in the pediatric ward late at night and see a lone boy wandering the halls, don't be afraid. Just know that he's one of our own, and he means no harm. Oasis Medical Center wasn't a place anyone would mistake for a retreat, despite its name. It was an old, rundown hospital built in the 60s, with updates so infrequent it was like stepping back in time. But a paycheck is a paycheck, and you take work where you can find it. I was an IT specialist by day, a position that often had me walking the endless maze of hallways to fix computers and other electronic equipment. The medical staff appreciated me, and I didn't mind the work, until I started noticing the faces. The first time it happened, I was installing a software update on one of the heart rate monitors in room 417. Leaning over, I glanced at the screen, waiting for the loading bar to fill. And there, reflected in the glass, was a face. Not my face, mind you, but a face I didn't recognize. Old, sunken eyes, hollow cheeks. A man, or what used to be one. I spun around. The room was empty, except for the patient, an elderly woman asleep in her bed. The hairs on my arms stood up. But I told myself it was just stress, 
lack of sleep, whatever. I shook it off and finished the update. The next time, I was in the surgical ward, calibrating a piece of equipment I couldn't even pronounce. I bent down to adjust a dial when I saw another face in the reflective surface of the metal tray next to me. A young girl this time, with eyes too big for her face, staring at me like I had done something wrong. I jerked back, my heart pounding against my ribs. A nurse walked by, glancing curiously at me. You okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I muttered, doubting the words even as I said them. This started happening more frequently. Faces in computer monitors, faces in the glass panels of medicine cabinets, faces in the reflective surfaces of surgical tools. Always when I was alone, always when I least expected it. And always different. Men, women, young, old, eyes full of sadness, anger, or accusation. I couldn't ignore it any longer. I started digging through old hospital records, scouring news articles online, anything to give me some insight. What I found sent a chill down my spine. Over the years, Oasis Medical Center had an unusually high number of unexplained deaths. Patients who passed away under mysterious circumstances, with causes of death listed as inconclusive. Were these the faces I was seeing? Spirits trapped in the hospital, bound to the place where they had met their untimely end? I took my findings to management, but they dismissed me, saying that it was all hearsay and coincidences. They even hinted that if I kept it up, I would be let go. So I shut up, but I didn't stop looking. I was transferred to the night shift. Less staff, fewer questions. I spent my nights walking the dark halls, my ears straining for sounds, my eyes narrowed in concentration. I took to carrying a small pocket mirror, taking it out to glimpse reflections when I felt I was being watched. And that's when I saw her, the young girl, the one I'd seen in the surgical ward, reflected in my pocket mirror. She looked at me and pointed behind me. I turned around and there, on the computer monitor, was a series of numbers. Medical records, a date, I didn't know. I documented everything, started putting pieces together, dates matching records and news articles. It was like a grim puzzle, each face corresponding to an unexplained death, each one a silent scream, a plea for justice. But what could I do? I was no detective, no avenger of spirits. Even now, as I sit in my makeshift office, surrounded by equipment that should be devoid of anything supernatural, I know I'm not alone. The faces are still there, glimpses in the glass, flickers on the screen. Are they asking me for my help or warning me? I don't know. All I know is that I can't escape them. Even as I write this, a reflection not my own stares back at me from the monitor's glass. It watches me, studies me, and for a brief moment, I swear it smiles. So I'm left with a choice. Dig deeper, risk my job, my sanity, to give these lost souls a voice, or turn away, leave the hospital, and hope that the faces in the glass are bound to this place and not me. Each night, as I clock in and walk the dim corridors, I can't shake the feeling that my decision is no longer just about me. And in every reflection, I see eyes, watching, waiting, wondering what I'm going to do next. I had always prided myself on being rational, even keeled. You have to be when you're a maintenance technician in a sprawling facility like St. Augustine's Hospital. You troubleshoot electrical issues, fix leaky pipes, and ignore whatever local legends float around the place, except for the unexplained breezes in the West Wing. 
When I mentioned the cold drafts to Carol, the senior nurse who'd been at St. Augustine since the days of dial-up internet, she leaned in. Oh yeah, they come and go. You get used to it. That was easier said than done. The West Wing had been closed off for years, a relic of older, less efficient designs. Budget cuts, someone had mumbled once, but who knows. Despite its emptiness, it was my responsibility to make periodic checks for structural issues, leaks, and electrical faults. The first time I felt the breeze, I was at the end of one of those routine checks. My hand was on the door, ready to leave the derelict wing when it happened. An inexplicable blast of cold air hit me, snaking its way down my collar, chilling me to the bone. The air was still. Windows were bolted shut, doors sealed. There was no rational explanation for it. I tried to dismiss it, to chalk it up as one of those quirks old buildings have. But then it happened again, and each time the breeze seemed to last longer, to feel colder. It became a distracting, unsettling mystery that I couldn't ignore. I even pulled up old blueprints of the hospital, trying to find some architectural explanation. Air shafts, hidden vents, anything. I found none. Determined to solve the puzzle, I decided to stay overnight in the West Wing. If there was a pattern to the chill winds, I was going to find it. Armed with thermal sensors and a high-definition camera, I set up my equipment in the center of the wing. The night stretched on, endless and uneventful until about 3 a.m. Just as I was questioning my own sanity for doing this, the temperature readings on my thermal sensor plummeted. A chill wind, stronger than any before, howled through the corridor. Papers scattered, old window blinds clattered against the walls, and I was engulfed in a cold unlike anything I had ever felt. I grabbed my camera, fingers trembling, and scanned the room but there was nothing, no visible source, just the icy gusts battering against me as if pushing me away out of the wing. When the winds finally ceased, I was left standing there, disoriented and chilled to my core. The thermal sensors normalized, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had trespassed into something I didn't understand. I packed up my equipment, my movements robotic, I couldn't wait to leave, but as I reached the door to the exit, I hesitated. My camera lay on the table, its lens staring back at me. I played back the footage, fast forwarding through hours of nothingness, until I reached the moment when the winds began. There it was, the papers scattering, the blinds clattering, and then I saw it, a shadow, fleeting and barely discernible moving against the current of the wind, not with it. It was as if something had walked through, passed by me, unnoticed and undisturbed by the laws of physics. I never spoke of it, never showed anyone the footage. What could I say? What rational explanation could I offer? But I knew I couldn't go back to that wing, not alone, maybe not ever. Months passed and the West Wing became a distant concern buried under the weight of more immediate issues. It became easier to ignore, easier to forget. But the air in the hospital changed, sometimes subtly, sometimes noticeably. A cold draft would pass through a crowded hallway, or a sudden chill would fill a warm room. Nurses blamed the air conditioning and doctors shrugged it off. Only I knew that something had left the West Wing, something that defied explanation. And while the icy winds in the derelict wing had ceased, they now seemed to wander the hospital freely. I often find myself wondering where the chill will appear next, whether it's aimless or searching for something, something that perhaps only it understands. And so the hospital's pulse continues, now with a cold breath that reminds me that there are things in this world that remain beyond understanding things that you can neither repair nor explain.
the piercing shriek of a monitor alarm jolted me awake. I rushed down the hall to room 309, the source of the commotion. Rounding the corner, I saw the patient's heart monitor flashing a flat green line. Code blue, I called out. The rapid response team mobilized within seconds, crashing through the door prepared to resuscitate the patient. But as we entered, we found the patient sitting up in bed, very much alive and very confused, breathing normally. He looked at us bewildered as his monitor continued to show no heart rhythm. But what's this all about? He asked hoarsely. The doctor quickly checked his pulse and found it steady. No CPR needed. After a manual reset, the monitor returned to normal. False alarm. Later at the nurse's station, we marveled at the bizarre malfunction. But I knew better after hearing similar stories. Room 309's spiritual tenant wanted to test our response time. We passed this supernatural drill with flying colors. My heart still racing from the adrenaline rush, I said a little prayer of thanks that our patient was unharmed. As long as I'm working here, our ghostly resident can set off all the false monitor alarms they want. I'll always be ready for anything, paranormal or otherwise. It was a slow night. Halfway into my graveyard shift as a security guard, I found myself slumped in my chair, sipping stale coffee and watching feeds from the security camera. Monitors flickered in a rhythmic cycle through different angles of the hospital. Corridors, waiting rooms, stairwells. The place was a labyrinth after dark, silent except for the hum of machinery. My eyes were getting heavy when I saw it. Camera 12, third floor corridor. A shadowy figure moved along the wall, elongated and indistinct. I blinked, rubbed my eyes. The figure remained, inching closer to the far end of the hallway where it intersected with another. I glanced at the clock, 3.07 AM. Grabbing my flashlight and keys, I made my way to the third floor. Adrenaline cut through my drowsiness. Either somebody had breached security, or I was chasing phantoms. The elevator dinged softly, doors sliding open. I stepped out, flicked on the flashlight, and swept the beam down the corridor. Nothing. I checked the adjacent hallways, even popped into a few rooms. No sign of an intruder. Yet the unsettling sensation of being observed washed over me. I shook it off and headed back to the control room, a rational part of me figuring it was a camera glitch or a trick of the light. Back at my desk, I rewound the footage. The shadowy figure reappeared at the same spot, moving in the same direction, fading as it reached the hallway's end. No logical explanation came to mind. I logged the incident, noting the time and camera number, though omitting my eerie feelings. No need for people to question my sanity. In the nights that followed, I watched that corridor like a hawk. The figure never reappeared, but the memory lurked in the back of my mind, a puzzle with missing pieces. And though I still patrol the third floor, I do it with a quicker step, always reminding myself to breathe, especially when my flashlight casts long shadows on the wall. As an ICU nurse, I've witnessed many patients pass, but Tony's death stunned me in a way that I still can't explain. He was a beloved grandfather in his late 60s, on life support after a major stroke. His chances were slim, but the family held out hope. Late one night during my shift, Tony's monitors suddenly started alarms. He had gone into cardiac arrest. We immediately started CPR, 
but the chaotic noise faded into the background as I tried to focus. The doctor began asking Tony questions, trying to stimulate any remaining brain activity. Tony, can you hear me? If you can hear me, try to respond. To my shock, a weak voice croaked, Yes, doc, I'm still here. The doctor and I froze and looked at each other with wide eyes. The voice was clearly Tony's, but it was impossible. He had flatlined. Tony, are you in any pain? The doctor continued warily. Again, Tony's strained voice uttered, No, all the pain's gone now. My hands shook as I continued chest compressions. How was he speaking with no heart rhythm? Do you see anything around you, Tony? Any bright lights? Asked the doctor. No lights, just peaceful darkness. Tony responded. His voice grew fainter with each word. It's all right, Doc. My time's done. And please tell my family I love them. Then silence. Ten minutes later, we finally ceased efforts and called his time of death. But the chill from hearing a dead man's voice never left me. I avoided mentioning the supernatural event in my report. Who would believe a patient conversed while flatlined? I questioned my own sanity, but deep down I know what I heard. Since that night, I've paid closer attention as patients slip away. A few times, I'm certain that I've made out faint whispers of loved ones' names, or gasped prayers long after the vitals ceased, their voices like wisps of vapor, untethered from their bodies. Somehow, in those final moments between life and whatever lies beyond, there's an uncanny communication that technology can't detect. The monitor may show a flatline, but the spirit still stirs. Perhaps we put too much faith in our tools, and not enough in forces unseen. There's so much about the human spirit that eludes even our most advanced science. All I know is that day, Tony spoke to us beyond the veil of life, through a means unknown. His fading words will forever resonate. Wherever his spirit traveled next, I hope he found the peace he sought. For now, I keep monitoring the screen, but listening beyond it as well, honoring the mysterious ways the dying may speak their last pieces, even after the ship of life has sailed. Some ports of call lie beyond the reach of our maps, we can only have faith in the journey. I've always been a deep sleeper, the kind who could sleep through thunderstorms and blaring alarms. So when I began feeling unusually fatigued during the day, I decided to invest in a sleep tracker. The sleek wristband would monitor my sleep patterns, providing insights into the quality and duration of my rest. The first morning after wearing it, I eagerly checked the data. To my surprise, the tracker showed periods of wakefulness during the night, with a significant amount of activity around 3 a.m. According to the device, I had been up and walking around for nearly an hour. I brushed it off as a glitch, assuming the tracker needed calibration. But night after night, the pattern persisted. Each morning, the device showed me awake and active during the early hours, even though I had no recollection of ever leaving my bed. Curiosity turning to concern, I decided to set up a night vision camera in my bedroom. If I was indeed sleepwalking, I wanted to know. The next morning, I played back the footage with bated breath. The room was bathed in the soft green glow of the night vision. For the first few hours, all was still. But then, around 3 a.m., something startling occurred. I saw myself sit up, eyes wide open, but with a vacant stare. Slowly, I climbed out of bed and began to wander around the room, touching objects, pausing occasionally as if listening to something inaudible. After nearly an hour, I returned to bed, settling back into a deep sleep. 
the footage was unsettling. My sleepwalking self moved with a deliberateness that was eerie, displaying behaviors and mannerisms I didn't recognize. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I consulted a sleep specialist. He diagnosed me with somnambulism, a sleep disorder that results in episodes of walking or performing complex tasks while asleep. Stress, he said, was a common trigger, but there was something he couldn't explain. During one of our sessions, I mentioned the way I'd pause during my nocturnal wanderings, as if listening to someone. Intrigued, he suggested an experiment. We would conduct an overnight observation, using sensitive audio equipment to pick up any sounds that might be occurring during my episodes. The results were chilling. During one of my sleepwalking episodes, the microphones picked up faint whispers, too soft to be discernible, but unmistakably human. The doctor was baffled, unable to provide a logical explanation. Returning home, I decided to delve into the history of my house. A deep dive into local archives revealed a tragic tale. A century ago, a young woman named Clara had lived in the house. She had been known to converse with unseen friends, often wandering the house at night, whispering secrets into the dark. One fateful evening, she disappeared, never to be seen again. The parallels were uncanny. Was I tapping into some residual energy, reliving Clara's nocturnal conversations? Was she the source of the whispers? Seeking closure, I reached out to a medium. She conducted a seance, attempting to communicate with any spirits present. As the candles flickered, she made contact with Clara, who revealed her loneliness and desire for companionship. My sleepwalking episodes, it seemed, were a way for her to connect, to relive her nightly wanderings. The medium helped guide Clara to find peace, releasing her from the confines of the house. That night, for the first time in weeks, my sleep tracker showed a full, uninterrupted night of rest. The experience left me with a profound sense of wonder and respect for the mysteries of the universe. It was a reminder that sometimes, the lines between the past and the present, the living and the dead, are more intertwined than we could ever imagine. As I explored my new home, I stumbled upon a small room that seemed to be a child's bedroom. Time had left its mark, with peeling wallpaper and creaky floorboards. But what caught my attention was an old porcelain doll sitting on a rocking chair. She wore a faded blue dress, her hair neatly tied in a bun, and her glassy eyes seemed to gleam with an inner light. A small name tag around her neck read, Evelyn. There was something unsettling about those eyes. No matter where I moved in the room, it felt as if they were following me, watching my every move. I tried to shake off the feeling, attributing it to the stress of the move and my overactive imagination. Over the next few days, as I settled into the house, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Every time I passed the room, I'd glance in, and there she'd be, Miss Evelyn, her gaze fixed on me. One evening, to test my sanity, I turned the doll to face the window and left the room. But the next morning, she was back in her original position, her eyes locked onto the doorway. Curiosity piqued, I decided to research the history of the house. At the local library, I found old newspaper clippings and records. The house had once belonged to the Whitmore family. They had a daughter, Evelyn who tragically died at a young age. Devastated by the loss, her mother had commissioned a doll to be made in Evelyn's likeness, hoping it would provide some solace. The more I delved into the history, the more I began to connect the dots. Residents after the Whitmores reported strange occurrences, items moving on their own, soft giggles in the night, and the ever-present feeling of being watched. One evening, as I sat in the living room, I heard a soft humming coming from the direction of the child's room. 
I cautiously approached, the door creaking open to reveal Miss Evelyn, rocking gently in her chair, the room bathed in a soft, ethereal glow. Taking a deep breath, I addressed her. Evelyn, is that you? The room grew colder, and the doll's eyes seemed to shimmer. A soft voice, almost a whisper, replied, I'm lonely. Tears filled my eyes as I realized the truth. Evelyn's spirit was trapped, bound to the doll, longing for companionship and the life she never got to live. Determined to help, I reached out to a local medium. She conducted a seance, communicating with Evelyn's spirit. Through her, Evelyn conveyed her desire to be free, to move on and be reunited with her family. The medium performed a ritual, releasing Evelyn's spirit from the doll and helping her cross over to the other side. The atmosphere in the house immediately felt lighter. The oppressive weight of sadness lifted. Miss Evelyn, the doll, remained in the house, but her eyes no longer followed me. She sat in her rocking chair, a silent witness to the history of the house and the little girl who once called it home. I often think of Evelyn and hope that she found peace. Her doll serves as a reminder of the mysteries of the unknown and the thin line between the living and the dead. Our family road trips were always filled with laughter, games, and of course music. My wife, Aisha, our two kids, Maya and Sami and I, were on a summer drive through the heart of Virginia, heading towards the Blue Ridge Mountains. The landscape was picturesque, with rolling hills and dense forests flanking the highway. As we drove, I decided to scan the local radio stations, hoping to find some classic rock or perhaps a catchy pop tune. But what we stumbled upon was something entirely unexpected. The radio tuned into a station, WVLR Memories 88.9, and a soft, melodic song began to play. The lyrics spoke of a summer romance at a county fair, of stolen glances atop a Ferris wheel, and whispered promises under a starlit sky. Aisha suddenly gasped. I remember this that summer when we went to the county fair in Roanoke. We had our first kiss on the Ferris wheel. She looked at me with teary eyes, lost in the memory. But there was a problem. Aisha and I had never been to a county fair in Roanoke. We'd met in college in New York and had never visited Virginia until now. Before I could voice my confusion, another song began. This one was upbeat, detailing a family picnic by a lakeside with children laughing and playing in the water. Maya and Sammy's eyes lit up. That's like the time we went to Lake Anna and had that huge water balloon fight, Sammy exclaimed. Again, this was a memory that didn't exist. We'd never been to Lake Anna. Song after song, the radio played tunes that evoked memories we hadn't lived. There was the winter ballad that reminded Aisha of a snowy dance we'd never attended and the rock anthem that brought back memories of a concert where Maya had supposedly gotten her first guitar pick. The atmosphere in the car grew thick with a mix of nostalgia and confusion. It was as if the radio was tapping into an alternate timeline, playing songs from moments that had never occurred in our lives, but felt as real as any other memory. As the sun set, the signal began to fade and the mysterious WVLR Memories 88.9 was replaced by static. We drove in silence, each of us lost in our thoughts, trying to make sense of the phantom memories. We reached our destination, a cozy cabin in the mountains, but the events of the drive dominated our conversations. We speculated about the nature of memories, parallel universes, and the power of music to evoke emotions. That night, as the kids slept and Aisha and I sat on the porch, looking up at the stars, she whispered, even if those memories aren't real, they felt beautiful. It's like we got a glimpse into another life, another version of us. 
I nodded, wrapping my arm around her. Maybe in some other universe, those memories are real. And that version of us is reminiscing about our memories, wondering about a life where they met in New York and took road trips through Virginia. We laughed at the thought, but the magic of the forgotten playlist stayed with us. It was a reminder of the infinite possibilities of life, the countless paths not taken, and the beautiful moments that exist, whether we've lived them or not. It was a foggy evening as I drove through the winding roads of the Appalachian Mountains. The mist was thick, reducing visibility to just a few feet ahead. As I rounded a bend, I spotted a figure on the side of the road, thumb outstretched. Given the weather and the remoteness of the location, I decided to stop. The hitchhiker was a young woman, dressed in a faded floral dress that looked like it belonged to another era. Her eyes were a deep shade of blue, and there was a certain sadness about her. Thank you, she whispered as she climbed in. I need to get to Silverpine. I was taken aback. Silverpine was a town that had been abandoned after a mining disaster in the 1940s. Are you sure? There's nothing left of Silverpine. She nodded. It's where I need to be. We drove in silence, the only sound being the hum of the engine and the occasional droplets of rain hitting the windshield. As we approached the old location of Silver Pine, the fog grew denser. The hitchhiker pointed to a dilapidated sign barely visible through the mist. Just up ahead, she said. I slowed the car, trying to navigate through the thick fog. When I turned to ask her for more specific directions, I found the passenger seat empty. The door was still closed, and there was no sign of her anywhere. Confused and a little frightened, I continued driving until I reached the remnants of Silver Pine. The town was a ghostly sight, with decaying buildings and overgrown vegetation. In the town square, there was a memorial with names of those who had perished in the mining disaster. Curiosity got the better of me, and I approached the memorial. As I scanned the names, one caught my attention. Lila May Thompson. Below the name was a picture of the young woman I had picked up, wearing the same faded floral dress. A chill ran down my spine. I quickly got back in my car and drove away, the image of Lila May's sad blue eyes etched in my mind. The fog began to lift, and as I looked in the rearview mirror, Silver Pine disappeared into the mist, along with the phantom hitchhiker who had once called it home. The old, wrinkled map called to me from the dusty shelves of my grandfather's study. As a child, I had spent hours poring over its faded contours and landmarks, dreaming of the adventures it promised in foreign lands. But one road had always captivated my imagination, Route 00. It meandered whimsically across the map, not seeming to connect any two points in particular. My grandfather said he had never discovered where it led, though he had searched for years. When I inherited the map after his passing, the unfinished business of Route 00 beckoned. I set off on a journey to trace its path, hoping to uncover the secrets behind this mysterious road. Mile after mile I followed it, the dotted line leading me through forests and valleys, over hills and streams. Food and fuel dwindled as the days wore on, but I pressed forward, drawn irresistibly by the promise of what lay ahead. The road grew steadily narrower and less maintained. With each turn, the surroundings grew more ominous, the way ahead darker. Still I continued, shadows now seeming to creep from the woods to encircle me. Finally, the crumbling pavement dwindled to a single dirt track through the gnarled trees. 
My heart pounded as I glimpsed a small light shining in the distance. This was what I had been searching for all along. I stumbled into a clearing, where the moldering remains of an old carnival lay sprawled before me. This was a place that time had forgotten, that the world had left behind. As I walked slowly past the decaying tents and rides, memories of my childhood began flooding back, of warm summer nights spent at the county fair with grandfather. A carousel sat silent, once bright horses faded and peeling. In the hall of mirrors, I saw reflections, not of myself, but of friends and family, long gone. Around each corner lay a glimpse into my past, sending me deeper down forgotten paths in my own mind. I wandered for what felt like hours through the abandoned carnival, each exhibit triggering another vivid memory. The fun house with its warped mirrors took me back to the time I got lost as a child and stumbled out in tears. The broken down roller coaster reminded me of laughing wildly while clinging to my grandfather's arm. With every step, the past became more real than the decay surrounding me. I found myself mentally revisiting moments I hadn't thought of in years. The first time I rode a bike, school dances, graduations. It was as if this place held within it the very essence of my memories. Finally, I arrived at the abandoned Ferris wheel, rising skeletal against the night sky. One last carriage waited, as if beckoning me aboard for a final ride. I stepped into the creaking car, and as the wheel lurched into motion, began a slow ascent into the darkness above. Looking down, the road that had led me there now seemed to stretch on without end, two paths diverging, one into memory and one into infinite unknown. As the carriage rocked higher, pulling me away, flickers of past regrets and unrealized dreams began to play before my eyes. I saw the paths not taken, the risks not ventured, but interspersed were memories of accomplishments, loved ones, moments of joy, a kaleidoscope of memory and emotion engulfed me, somehow more vivid and real than anything in my present life. I knew then the truth about Route 00. It leads wanderers not to any physical place, but deep into the recesses of their own hearts, minds and fears, revealing their secrets. Whether it was real or only a dream, I may never know. But I emerged from that forest changed, Memories made vivid again, mysteries of my own heart illuminated. The journey itself was the destination. Route 00 is an invitation to reckon with where you've been, who you became along the way, and where those winding back roads of life might yet lead, if you dare to follow them. It was supposed to be a simple road trip. My friends, Priya, Carlos, and I, had planned a weekend getaway to a cabin in the woods. The drive was straightforward, a four-hour journey through the heart of Oregon's dense forests. We set off early in the morning, our car packed with snacks, music playlists ready, and spirits high. As we drove, we chatted, sang along to our favorite songs, and admired the scenic beauty outside. About two hours into our journey, we approached a tunnel carved into the side of a mountain. The entrance was framed by old, moss-covered stones, and the inside was pitch black, the other end not visible. Carlos, who was driving, joked, feels like we're entering the twilight zone. We laughed, but as we entered the tunnel, an eerie silence enveloped the car. The radio lost signal, and our voices seemed muffled, as if the very air inside the tunnel was absorbing sound. It felt like mere minutes before we emerged on the other side, blinking against the bright sunlight. We all let out a collective sigh of relief, the tunnel's oppressive atmosphere still fresh in our minds. But as we continued driving, something felt off. The landscape looked different, more overgrown, as if nature had reclaimed the area. 
The road signs indicated that we were only 10 minutes away from our cabin, which was impossible given we had at least two more hours to go. Confused, I checked my watch, expecting it to be around noon. But to my shock, it read 5.30 p.m. Priya checked her phone, and it showed the same time. We had somehow lost over five hours, but the journey through the tunnel had felt like mere minutes. Panic set in. We tried to retrace our steps, but everything was a blur. We remembered entering the tunnel, the silence, and then exiting into the changed landscape. When we reached the cabin, the owner, an elderly woman named Mrs. Adler, greeted us. Seeing our distressed faces, she invited us in for tea. As we recounted our experience, she listened intently, nodding occasionally. Once we finished, she sighed. Ah, the lost tunnel. I've heard tales, but you're the first I've met who's experienced it. She explained that the tunnel was ancient, older than any records could trace. Over the years, travelers had reported similar experiences, losing hours or even days after passing through. No one knew why or how it happened, but it was always on days when the sun was particularly bright, casting the tunnel into deep shadow. Mrs. Adler's words sent chills down our spines. We were grateful to be safe, but the lost hours weighed heavily on our minds. What had happened in the time we couldn't account for? The rest of the weekend was uneventful, but the mystery of the lost tunnel stayed with us. We decided to take a different route home, not wanting to risk another encounter. To this day, we still wonder about those lost hours. Were we in some sort of time warp? Did we experience things we couldn't remember? The answers remain elusive, but one thing is certain. The lost tunnel, with its ability to bend and steal time, is a reminder of the mysteries that still exist in our world, waiting to be discovered. The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, on certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. The stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, 
I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge. Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. Rotting planks whizzed under my tires and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone, but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost's wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. Blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. But the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. Flat tire, middle of nowhere, no cell reception, the trifecta of a road trip gone bad. I cursed under my breath as I surveyed the situation. My car sat lopsided on the gravel road, as desolate a spot as you could imagine. The sky was beginning to bruise with twilight, and the prospects of changing a tire in the dark were far from appealing. Just when I thought things couldn't get worse, Headlights appeared in my rearview mirror, a pickup truck, ancient but well-kept, slowing down as it approached. A sliver of hope. Maybe I wasn't so unlucky after all. The truck parked behind me and out stepped a man, older, weather-beaten but spry. His overalls were stained with years of oil and grit, the name Eugene embroidered above his heart. Looks like you could use some help, he said squinting at my flat tire. Would be much appreciated, I replied, relief washing over me. Eugene moved with a quiet efficiency, unpacking his toolkit and getting to work. His hands were strong, deft, each movement precise. In no time he had the flat tire off and the spare on. There you go, he said, wiping his hands on a rag. Good as new. I couldn't believe my luck. How much do I owe you? He waved a dismissive hand. Consider it a favor. Just pay it forward when you can. I thanked him profusely, 
still awed by the timely intervention. As he drove away, his truck's taillights faded into the encroaching darkness, as if swallowed whole. When I got back into town, I headed straight for the nearest garage to get a proper tire replacement. While there, I mentioned Eugene and how he'd helped me out. The mechanic paused, his face turning a shade paler. Did you say Eugene? Drives an old Ford pickup? Yeah, that's him. Know him. The mechanic looked at me as if I'd grown a second head. Eugene's been dead for years, passed away in that very truck, a collision up on Millersfield Road. A cold shiver trickled down my spine. That's impossible. He helped me just a couple hours ago, changed my flat tire and everything. The mechanic stared, then walked over to a cluttered bulletin board on the wall. He shuffled through various papers and pulled out a faded newspaper clipping, handed it to me. The headline read, Local Mechanic Dies in Tragic Accident. And there he was, Eugene, unmistakable despite the grainy black and white photograph, that familiar smile, those wise eyes. I felt my knees weaken, my stomach turn. Looks like Eugene's still looking out for folks, the mechanic murmured, reclaiming the article and pinning it back on the board. I left the garage in a daze, new tire in place, but my understanding of reality irrevocably altered. I had been helped by a man who was no longer of this world, a long dead handyman, still aiding travelers in distress. As I drove away, the thought weighed on me, heavy but oddly comforting. Whatever force let Eugene linger, it was a benevolent one, a shred of goodness stitched into the fabric of an otherwise indifferent universe. And as I merged onto the highway, my eyes flicked to the rearview mirror, half expecting to see those headlights one more time. But all that met my gaze was the open road and the gathering night. I was driving the empty stretch of highway late at night, glancing at the peeling billboards littering the roadside. Most displayed dull ads for cheap motels and roadside diners, but one caught my eye, a blank white sign marked only with black lettering. Turn back now. A prickle ran down my neck. It seemed less a warning than a dark prophecy, but I shook off my unease and drove on through the creeping fog. Miles later, Another mysterious billboard emerged. Last exit, one mile. Again, a creep of dread. These signs almost seemed to know my presence here, long after midnight on this abandoned route. I chalked it up to fatigue and the mist playing tricks. But soon, more ominous messages began to take shape in the haze. We have been waiting. Your journey ends here. Each gave me a start, my imagination spiraling. Who was sending these silent warnings? Distracted, I nearly missed a faded placard peeking from the thicket. Turn back, dead end ahead. I slowed, gripping the wheel. This deserted back road was a shortcut I'd taken for years without incident, but the sign's persistent warnings filled me with foreboding. Still, only a few more miles to go. I pushed on warily. That's when it emerged ahead a towering billboard stark against the darkness. Last chance. My breath caught. Dread coursed through me, but the road ahead remained smooth and empty. With a shaking laugh, I dismissed my fears as fanciful. The messages were merely pranks, not grim portents. But then, around a sharp bend, my headlights fell upon one final board, rooted in the dirt shoulder. Its message turned my blood to ice. Sarah, we are waiting for you. The breath left my chest. My name on this remote road, impossible yet undeniably real. These were no pranks, but dire warnings from an unknown force. I floored the gas pedal, swerving around the last sign. Had to outrun this nightmare highway with its messages from beyond the void. Tires squealing 
I raced on through the dark, eyes wild for a branching road to escape this valley of omens. But the way ahead remained stubbornly straight and desolate, my only choice forward or back. And then, behind me, a new light flared, harsh and blinding. An engine roared, drawing closer until it loomed large in my rear view. An unmarked white van, creeping up fast, headlights seeming to glow with malevolence. My terrified gaze jumped back to the road ahead. No exits, no turnoffs to shake my pursuer. The van edged nearer until it was just feet from my bumper, high beams flooding my car, trapped on this road between darkness and darkness. This was the end the omens foretold. So I made my choice, floor the gas and leave the road entirely. My car jolted down the rocky shoulder, slamming into the ditch. The van blared past, unable to follow. Wheels spinning, I gritted my teeth and slammed the pedal down, fighting to climb out of the gully. With one last grunt of effort, my battered car lurched back onto the pavement. The white van was gone, its high beams fading into the distance. I rolled to a stop, hazard lights blinking, breath heaving. A close call, but I'd escaped the road's omens and my pursuer along with it. Relief flooded through me as I steadied my shaking hands, but relief faded to chilling awe as I peered behind me. At the spot where I left the road, there stood no ditch or rocky drop-off, only more cracked pavement stretching unbroken into the past. No gully existed to have trapped me. There was no earthly reason I should be free. The full force of realization hit me, this was no ordinary road. Something beyond reason led me here, and now let me go, spared from the grim fate the signs foretold. Numb, I drove on until finally reaching safe asphalt and lamp-lit streets. But I knew now never again to take that darkness-veiled back road, for I had glimpsed the void and those who dwell beyond. By some grace, I slipped free this time, but next time, I may not escape the highway's messages from beyond. The waiting ones would have their due. The long stretch of midnight highway unfurled before me as I drove through the rugged countryside. This desolate road was a shortcut to my destination, but my grip tightened on the wheel as local legends surfaced in my mind. Locals had spoken of this highway's hauntings, phantoms who preyed upon lost travelers. I tried to shake off my nerves. Ghost stories were merely fiction after all. But alone on this forgotten route, I could not ignore the chill creeping down my spine. My headlights illuminated a battered sign. Scenic Route 7. This remote byway was said to be plagued by a variety of supernatural horrors. In Ireland, nearly identical roads held the same name and tales of spirits known as Wailing Women, their shrieks echoing as they searched eternally for their lost children. In Japan, an analogous winding highway crossed the forest of Aokigahara, infamous for its yurei ghosts of the forgotten. But the local legend that unnerved me most centered around a phantom hitchhiker. Stories told of a young woman dressed in white standing on the roadside, silently begging for a ride. Any driver who dared stop for her soon disappeared, never to be seen again. My gaslight suddenly blinked on, and my stomach dropped. I was running low on fuel, still miles from civilization. With no choice, I kept driving down the pitch black road. The rocky cliffs around me seemed to close in as a dense fog rolled across my path. I could barely see ahead when through the mist, I spotted a faded sign for a gas station. Grateful, I veered off towards the weathered building. Perhaps they still provided services to wayward travelers like myself. But as I pulled up, not a light shone in the decrepit station. A rusty old pump stood unused amidst weeds. 
Everything about the place screamed abandonment, except for one detail, a yellow payphone under an overhanging roof. Could it possibly still work? Worth a try, since my cell had no signal. I dug for loose change in my glove box and walked over. The payphone's cracked receiver felt heavy and cold in my hand. I lifted it to my ear, deposited my coins, and miraculously heard a dial tone. Quickly I punched 911, seeking aid, or at least directions. One ring, then two. Suddenly a girl's voice answered, her tones strange and distant. Please, help me. I jumped, taken aback. I cautiously asked who was speaking, but she only replied again, now clearly desperate. Please, you must help. He's coming. Her plea sent a chill through me, but I pressed for details. Where was she? What was happening? The voice grew fainter, as if speaking from the end of a long tunnel. Her last words sank my heart. He's here. He's... Then only static. I slammed the receiver down, breathing fast. This was no 911 call. Dread flooded my veins at the implication. Somehow I had connected directly with the ghost girl hitchhiker herself, calling across dimensions for aid. I ran back to my car, throwing it into gear. Peeling out back onto the road, I pushed the gas pedal to the floor. But only minutes later, through my headlights piercing the night mist, a shadow took shape. The silhouette of a young woman emerged. My blood turned to ice. It was her. The phantom wore a gossamer white dress, raven hair flowing untamed over her face. She stood utterly still, thumb outraised. Every fiber of my being screamed not to stop. But her form drew closer in my high beams, her thumb still desperately lifted. Against all reason, I pulled over, though never stopping fully. Perhaps I could help free her spirit. She floated to my passenger window, peering in. And then I saw her face, skin paler than snow, eyes jet black and devoid of life. Her beauty was chilling, otherworldly. This was no trapped soul, but something far more sinister. Ancient instinct took over, and I floored the gas. The phantom smile stretched unnaturally wide as I left her behind, fading back into the fog. I raced onwards, pursued only by my pounding heart. Local legends were true. This was a haunted highway, stalked by a deceiving, vengeful ghost. I dared not glance back to see if she followed still. Only the road ahead mattered now. I drove until I reached the highway's end, where it rejoined the main interstate. The disappeared into dawn's first light. But I know I'll never take the haunted detour of Road 7 again. For some journeys lead places from which we can never return, waylaid forever by the spirits that walk our darkest byways. The highway was a ribbon of darkness, my truck's headlights barely making a dent. Mile after endless mile, I'd been listening to country songs and chugging lukewarm coffee. There's a rhythm to the road at night, a hum that can hypnotize you if you're not careful. My eyes started to blur, a dangerous lull seeping into my bones. That's when I saw her, a figure on the side of the road, draped in what looked like a white shawl. Odd. People don't usually walk along interstates at 3 a.m., not in places like this, where the closest town is a good half-hour drive away. Something about her posture said she wasn't hitchhiking, wasn't lost. She seemed to be waiting for something, or someone. My first instinct was to drive past. Maybe it was fatigue. Maybe it was the jaded part of me that thought it was some sort of setup. But something compelled me to pull over, tires crunching on the gravel shoulder. She approached the truck without hesitation, as if she'd been expecting me. No face, just darkness under the hood of her shawl. But when she spoke, her voice was young, almost melodious. Do you seek fortune, driver? I almost laughed. 
fortune was a long shot for a guy hauling freight cross country. More like decent mileage and good coffee. Her head tilted, considering. Follow me, she said. And then she turned away, floating, yeah, floating, about a foot above the ground. My instincts screamed not to, but I was suddenly overtaken by curiosity. Shifting the truck into gear, I trailed her as she glided smoothly along the edge of the road. The whole setup screamed of legends, of La Llorona, or the Japanese Yurei. But this wasn't Mexico or Japan. This was a lonely stretch of American asphalt. Eventually, she led me off the highway onto an unmarked dirt road. My truck bumped and jostled, and for a moment I feared I'd lose her in the dust and darkness. But she was always just ahead, an eerie beacon. The road ended abruptly at the entrance to what looked like an abandoned barn. She stopped and turned toward me. Inside, you will find what you seek. I should have bolted right then, turned that truck around and sped back to the sanctuary of the highway. But I didn't. Instead, I stepped out and walked into the barn. The wood creaked under my weight, dust motes floating lazily in the slivers of moonlight that snuck through the gaps in the slats. There was something on a rickety table at the center, half buried under a tattered cloth, a metal box with an intricate lock. I reached out, hands trembling. Before I could touch it, a cold wind blasted through the barn, extinguishing what little light there was. My heart hammered in my chest. I groped around, grabbed the box, and bolted back to my truck. The figure was gone. I didn't open the box until I'd driven a good hundred miles. Inside, nestled in faded velvet, was an antique pocket watch. I grabbed it and flipped it open. The time was stuck at 3.15, the exact moment I'd first seen her. Only then did it hit me. What if she'd led me to something darker, something malevolent? I felt a shiver creep up my spine, but by then, the road was pulling me again, back into its monotonous hum, and the night stretched long and endless ahead. It was mid-October when I settled into an old-style, somewhat run-down house in Little Rock. The price was a steal, and the neighborhood was drenched in the kind of history that made every building intriguing. The house itself was a classic, probably around a century old, with creaky wooden floors, a grand staircase, and, most notably, a spacious attic with a peculiar, tiny door. The first few days went by uneventfully as I busied myself with unpacking and cleaning. However, about a week after moving in, the oddities began. I was brushing my teeth one night when I heard a soft, indistinct murmur. I paused, listening. It sounded like whispers, but I was alone, and it was late at night. The rational side of me attributed it to the wind, or maybe the old pipes. I went to bed pushing the eerie feeling aside. However, the whispers didn't stop. They grew more persistent, primarily at night, and seemed to emanate from the walls themselves, particularly from the direction of the attic. I could never make out any distinct words, but the tone. The tone was what unsettled me. It was as though I was overhearing a tense conversation charged with urgency. After several nights, curiosity overcame my fear. I needed to know if there was anything in the attic. Maybe some old device was left there, or there were holes that let the wind in, creating these sounds. With a flashlight in my hand and my heart pounding, I ascended the narrow staircase to the attic one evening. The air in the attic was stale, thick with dust that danced in the beam of my flashlight. Boxes, old furniture, and various discarded household items were the attic's sole occupants. No sinister device, no holes in the walls, just silence and the weight of decades past. However, when I swung my light towards the walls, I noticed something odd. The tiny door I had found peculiar the first day seemed slightly ajar, 
which was strange because it had been stuck fast when I'd first explored the attic. As I approached it, the whispers grew louder, an urgent, low cacophony that seemed to resonate right out of the walls. It felt like stepping into a stream, the sound washing over me, drowning out my thoughts. I reached out, hesitantly, and pushed the door open with a creaking that protested the movement. Inside, there was nothing but darkness and thick, oppressive silence that seemed to absorb the whispers. I was about to step inside when the temperature around me plummeted. The sudden cold was biting, tangible, like walking into an unseen cloud of ice. The flashlight flickered nervously in my hand, and the whispers crescendoed into a frantic hiss, surrounding me, urging me, pushing me. Panicked, I stumbled backward, out of the cold spot, and the flashlight beam steadied. With my heart in my throat, I slammed the tiny door shut, and as if I had muted a radio, the whispers stopped. The silence in the attic was deafening. I practically tripped over myself getting down the stairs and didn't stop until I was out of the house, gasping for air on the front lawn. I stayed with a friend that night, and within the week, I was out of the house, my curiosity extinguished entirely by fear. I did some research later and found out through local historical societies and a bit of personal digging into past residents that my charming old house had once been the residence of a family involved in spiritualism and seances during the late 1800s. The tiny door in the attic was part of a spirit room, a specific space created to communicate with the other side. I never went back to the house and I never heard the whispers again. However, the memory of that cold, urgent hissing in the darkness isn't something I'll easily forget. It's one thing to hear about the city's haunted history. It's quite another to have lived in it, even for just a few weeks. Nightfall in the forest has its own language. The rustling leaves, the far-off hoot of an owl, and the subtle creaks of swaying trees form a symphony that speaks to the insomniac in me. On nights when sleep is a distant promise, I find myself outside, in a small clearing near my cabin, staring at the sky sprinkled with stars. But it was last night that the forest revealed a chapter of its language I had never understood before. I stepped into the clearing, my eyes tracing the familiar constellations. Orion's Belt, Cassiopeia, Ursa Major. Just as I began to retreat back to the cabin, I noticed it. The shadows of the trees were shifting, not the way shadows normally do, flitting and fading with the passing clouds or moonlight, but in a deliberate, rhythmic motion. The towering shapes of oaks and pines morphed their silhouettes transforming into figures so massive, they seemed like giants. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and even pinched myself. The shapes remained. They danced in slow circles, their movements synchronized with the songs of the night. Each sway of their elongated arms in harmony with the rustle of leaves, each step in tune with the creaking of branches. My heart thudded in my chest, not out of fear, but awe. My feet felt anchored to the ground, as if the very earth commanded me to witness this hidden ritual. I fumbled for my phone, considering capturing this surreal spectacle, but something stopped me. The act felt intrusive, like snapping a photo in the middle of a sacred ceremony. So I watched, my eyes wide, my breath shallow, as the giants continued their dance. As the first light of dawn began to stretch across the sky, the figures gradually retreated, their forms disentangling from the shapes of giants back into the gnarled branches and trunks of trees. Just like that, the forest returned to its usual self, as if the giants had been nothing more than figments of my imagination. I walked back to the cabin in a daze, the image of the dancing giants imprinted on my mind like an indelible ink. Throughout the day, 
I pondered what I had witnessed. Was it a trick of the light, a vivid dream, or perhaps a rare glimpse into the forest's hidden folklore? Tonight, I find myself back in the clearing, watching the sky transition from the hues of sunset to the deep blue of night. The shadows stretch and loom as darkness descends, but there are no dancing giants this time. Whether they were a one-time marvel or a regular event for which I lack the secret schedule, I may never know. However, the forest seems different to me now, more alive, more enigmatic, a place of mysteries and untold tales. I feel privileged to have witnessed its hidden dance, a spectacle that's added a new layer of wonder to my nights. And so, every evening, I continue to step out into the clearing, not just to look for the giants, but to listen, to observe, to be a part of the forest's ever-evolving language. Even if the giants never return, their dance remains etched in my memory, a secret chapter in my ongoing relationship with the night, a silent pact with the hidden rhythms of nature. The hike started like any other, a blend of sunlight and shadow, fresh air, and the freedom that only a trail could offer. My backpack settled comfortably on my shoulders as I took the familiar path leading up toward the mountain's summit. Birds offered their songs as if to cheer me on. Everything was right in the world, that is, until I stumbled upon the clearing. A gnarled tree stood at its center, its limbs reaching outward like a pleading gesture. Around the trunk, tattered pieces of paper were pinned, remnants of past hikers and their ventures. As a hiker myself, I knew it was a tradition. Leave a note, take a note, sort of like an unofficial ledger of those who've come and gone. Curious, I stepped closer to inspect the scraps of paper. Some were simple messages. John was here, or Sarah and Mike made it to the top. But my eyes caught on one poster, a missing person notice, weathered by time and rain. My breath hitched as I looked closer. It was me. Dated five years into the future, the paper showed a photograph remarkably like the one on my driver's license. My name was printed in bold, stark letters, missing. Last seen hiking near Stone Mountain. Contact if you have any information. A cold sweat broke out across my back. My hands trembled as I pulled my phone out to capture a picture of the poster, half expecting it to disappear like a figment of some surreal dream. But there it remained, in the frame of my screen, and in reality before me. Questions spiraled through my mind like a relentless whirlpool. Was this a prank? A cruel joke plotted by a friend or an enemy? But why? And how could they produce something so... convincing? Yet, if it was a joke, why did my gut churn with such intense unease, as though reality itself had twisted askew? I left the clearing as quickly as I could, my pace now a hurried march. The rest of the trail felt longer, the mountain air denser, the forest no longer whispered its comforting lullabies. Instead, it seemed to close in on me like an imposing maze. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, took on an ominous tone. I pushed on, propelled by a desire to put as much distance as possible between me and that eerie clearing. When I finally emerged from the trail, I felt like I'd been spat out from another world. I threw my gear into the car and sped home, where I examined the photo I'd taken. The image on the screen was as unsettling as the paper itself, a ghostly harbinger of a future I didn't understand. Days turned into weeks, and the incident transformed into an unsettling memory, buried but never forgotten. I considered showing the photo to friends, to family, even to the police. But something stopped me each time, the unsettling notion that some questions are better left unanswered. Still, 
The poster changed something fundamental in me. These days, when I hike, I steer clear of that specific trail, opting for paths that offer fewer questions and more peace of mind. Yet sometimes, when the night is still and sleep evades me, I find myself pondering that mysterious poster, a harbinger of an unspoken future. Could it be a twisted rip in the fabric of time, a prank, or a warning? I may never know. And perhaps that uncertainty is the most unsettling part of it all, a mystery that trails behind me like an ever-present shadow, lurking just beyond the horizon of my understanding. The first time I heard it, my hands froze over my dinner plate, fork half raised. The sound cut through the usual evening quiet, a human scream, elongated and piercing. My heart raced. Instinct pulled me to my feet, but reason anchored me. It happened again, another scream, the sound filling the empty corners of my cabin. My neighbor had warned me, said it was the birds, but a primal part of me buzzed with alarm. I had to know. Flashlight in hand, I ventured into the dark labyrinth of trees. Moonlight filtered through the canopy, casting shifting patterns on the ground. The forest seemed to breathe, and my footsteps sounded like an invasion. Then it happened. A scream so close I could almost feel the vibration in the air. I swung my flashlight toward the sound, half expecting to see a face twisted in anguish. Instead, a bird, a black silhouette against the dark sky, swooped from a branch and disappeared into the underbrush. More screams joined in, a cacophony that felt like an eerie choir. Birds? Mimicking human agony? My mind spun, juggling disbelief and the chilling reality. I watched as they fluttered from tree to tree, each scream indistinguishable from a human's. Yet, something was missing. No anguish, no pain. Just air funneled through feathers and beak. Eventually I returned home, but sleep eluded me. Lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, I wrestled with what I had heard, what I had seen. Nature, as it turns out, is neither kind nor malevolent. It simply is. The birds screamed not out of sorrow, but because that's what they did. A chilling phenomenon without rhyme or reason. Days turned into weeks, and I found a new routine. I still heard the birds, their nightly screams a haunting lullaby that no longer robbed me of sleep. It became a part of my life, another element in the complex mosaic of the forest. I never found out why the birds scream, and maybe that's the point. In a world teeming with questions, not all answers bring comfort. Sometimes the enigma is more tolerable than the truth. And so, I let the birds scream. They fill the night with sound, each cry an enigmatic note in the symphony of the forest. It's unsettling, yes, but it's also a reminder, a stark, unforgiving echo of life's complexities. And I listen. But for the past week, our hikes had gained an unexpected soundtrack. A second bark, echoing Stella's but coming from an unseen source. Every time Stella barked at a squirrel or sent a joyous hello into the wilderness, this other bark would respond. It was uncanny, a perfect mimic of Stella's own vocalizations, yet somehow hollow, as if coming from far away or perhaps from somewhere much closer than I cared to think. Tonight was no different. As we stepped onto the familiar path, Stella let out a playful bark, and sure enough, the second bark replied. This phantom canine always seemed to be just out of sight, hiding behind a curtain of trees and leaves. I had considered every reasonable explanation, 
a neighbor's dog, an animal with a similar sounding call, even the playful acoustics of the forest. But the more I heard it, the less it sounded like any of those things. Tonight, my curiosity reached its boiling point. I decided to find out once and for all where this other bark was coming from. Come on, Stella, let's find your friend, I said, a note of forced cheerfulness in my voice. Stella looked up at me, ears perked, as if she too sensed that this hike was different. I led her off the main trail, following the direction from which the second bark seemed to emanate. Stella hesitated, then followed, her steps more cautious than usual. The second bark sounded again, closer this time, pulling us deeper into the woods. The sun was setting, and shadows stretched long fingers across the path, making the trees appear taller and more menacing. Stella barked, perhaps sensing my tension, and the second bark answered, now sounding not just like an echo, but like a distorted version of Stella's bark, as if heard through a broken speaker. The forest was darker now, and I flicked on my flashlight, its beam cutting through the gloom. I felt disoriented, as if the trees had rearranged themselves to confuse me. It was foolish to be here after dark, I realized. My gut screamed at me to turn back, but I needed to know. Just then, Stella growled, a low, rumbling sound I'd never heard her make. The fur on her back stood on end. My heart pounded in my chest as I swung my flashlight around, half expecting to catch a pair of eyes staring back at us. But there was nothing, only an impenetrable wall of darkness. That's when it hit me. The second bark had stopped. The forest was silent, save for my own breathing and the distant rustle of leaves. Whatever had been mimicking Stella was gone, or perhaps it had never been there at all. I looked down at Stella, who seemed as relieved as I was to retreat. As we made our way back to the trail, the normal sounds of the forest gradually returned. The chirping of crickets, the hoot of an owl, even Stella's own occasional bark. But the second bark remained absent, as if swallowed by the woods. We never heard it again after that night, and our hikes returned to their peaceful routine. Yet the experience lingers at the back of my mind, a mystery without an answer. I still venture into the woods, drawn by their beauty and tranquility, but there's a cautiousness now, a heightened awareness. I listen more than I used to, attuned to the hidden life that teems just beyond the reach of sight and understanding. As for Stella, she still bounds ahead with joyful abandon, but I've noticed she sticks closer now, as if she too understands that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Sometimes I catch her pausing, ears perked, as if waiting for something, but whatever she's listening for remains silent, a haunting whisper that has vanished into the depths of the forest, leaving only questions in its wake. I had been exploring the dense woods for the weekend, a lone venture to satisfy my restless spirit. The well was not what I had expected to find. My plans involved wildlife photography and the simple joy of fire-cooked meals, not relics of human settlement deep in a place where even GPS feared to tread. I approached cautiously, the hairs on the back of my neck tingling with an instinctual caution. Nature had long reclaimed this space, but the well remained like a scar that refused to heal. The air was thick, and I felt the weight of a silence that seemed to have settled ages ago. Then came the voice. Help me. It was a whisper, a desperate plea spiraling up from the inky depths below. My blood ran cold. I strained my ears, wondering if it was a trick of the wind or an echo bouncing through the forest. Please, help me. There it was again, unmistakable this time, a voice tinged with anguish. My rational mind screamed at me, a voice from an ancient well, miles from any human habitation. 
impossible. Yet my conscience, that stubborn internal compass, refused to let me walk away. Against better judgment, I rummaged through my backpack for my flashlight and rope. Knotting the rope securely around a sturdy tree, I shined the flashlight into the well. Nothing but an impenetrable darkness stared back, swallowing the beam as if mocking my feeble attempt to unveil its secrets. With a deep breath, I began my descent, hand over hand, each downward movement a commitment to the unknown. The walls of the well closed in, damp and claustrophobic, and the air grew colder as I plunged further into the dark. Finally, my feet touched solid ground. I clicked on the flashlight and scanned my surroundings. My heart sank. There was nothing there, no trapped animal, no lost hiker, just a small vacant underground chamber with walls of stone and earth. The reality of my situation hit me like a wave. I was alone, in an ancient well, chasing a voice that couldn't possibly exist. I felt foolish and unsettled, unnerved by the echoing silence that now filled the space. As I began my ascent, pulling myself up the rope, a chilling thought crawled into my mind. What if the voice wasn't coming from the bottom, but from somewhere above? The realization propelled me faster, my muscles aching as I neared the top. When I finally emerged from the well, gasping for air, I looked around frantically. The forest appeared the same, indifferent to my turmoil, but the weight of unseen eyes pressed upon me. I pulled up the rope, packed my gear, and without a backward glance, retreated from that haunted place. The hike back to camp was a blur, my thoughts a jumble of relief and apprehension. Had I imagined it all? A trick of acoustics, perhaps. But what about that insistent plea, so filled with raw emotion? I broke camp the following morning, cutting my trip short. As I made my way out of the forest, I realized that I was leaving with more than just photographs and memories. I was taking a piece of the forest's unsettling enigma with me, a riddle that would forever remain unsolved. I never returned to that well, never sought it out on later trips or on any maps. Some mysteries, I decided, are better left as they are, unexplained echoes in the wilderness of both the world and the mind. Yet, the voice from the well has never left me, its plea lingering in quiet moments forever raising questions that dare not be answered. We were pretty beat from the long drive, but we stayed up late hanging around the fire, having some beers and grilling hot dogs. It felt good to be out here disconnected from everything. The woods were so peaceful at night. At some point, Dana said she heard music playing faintly in the distance. We all quieted down and listened. Sure enough, we could make out the indistinct sounds of people laughing and singing along to guitar music. Must be another group's campsite nearby. Let's go crash their party, Tyler said. He was pretty buzzed by then. Yeah, I want to see who else is out here, Dana added. She looked a little creeped out by the distant music and wanted company. I shrugged and figured why not. We grabbed flashlights and started hiking through the dark trees toward the sounds. I felt sticks and rocks poking into my feet through my thin sneakers. As we walked deeper into the woods, the music got louder and more raucous, like a full-on party. We shouted a few, hellos, but no one ever answered back. The forest just seemed to swallow up our voices. We kept on toward the sound of singing and laughing, even though the hair on my arms was standing up. I couldn't see any distant campfire light or anything. Finally, we came stumbling into a little clearing. They must be just on the other side, Tyler said excitedly, but there was nothing. The music cut off abruptly leaving just the normal nightwood sounds. No tents, coolers, picnic tables, nothing to indicate a campsite had been there at all. 
That's bizarre. I know I heard people here, Dana said in a small voice. We all felt the creep factor rising. Let's get back to our site, I urged. We turned our flashlights back toward where I thought our camp was. But after 15 minutes of walking, there was no sign of it. We were well and truly lost. The laughter was long gone. It was dead quiet now, except for branches scratching and critters scurrying. Even our own campfire light had vanished. We wandered in the dark woods for what felt like hours, getting more turned around by the minute. Exhausted and freaked out, we took shelter under a rocky overhang as the first light of dawn started glowing through the trees. I don't know what was going on in these woods, but we sure as hell couldn't wait to get out of there. This was one camping trip I won't be forgetting any time soon.